Good morning. Great to see everybody. Yeah, good. Terrific. Uh, so we're in this uh, series, Peter Pan, uh, living in a world with no adults. And I got to be honest with you, this is actually taking a turn I, I didn't expect. What I had in my mind was I wanted to help you be able to see that in the world you live in, uh, people no longer see themselves as taking on a responsibility. They see themselves taking on a title. And so I have the title of a parent, I have a title of mom, dad, I have a title of, of some office. And so in that title, I'm, I'm going to make the decisions I want to make, I'm going to do what I want. But they're not actually adults. They're not actually going, wait, this is a role I've stepped into. And I'm responsible in this role to sacrifice today for what's best for tomorrow. That's kind of basic to being an adult. But in the, in, in the beginning, I asked you, like, take a step back. Don't worry. I'm not, I'm not telling you to grow up. But in the process, we, we actually have stumbled upon some really cool principles from God's Word. And uh, we're going to keep doing that as we approach today. And so where we started was, hey, how do you become an adult? In a world where there are no adults, they're not going to ask you to grow up. There's, no, there's really not that much pressure for you to grow up. There's a lot of pressure for you to stay immature, to only care about your clothes and your friends and on and on. So what we discovered was the, what causes you to grow up, the force that causes you to grow up is when you accept God's call on your life. His, he gives you a God-given role that's defined by God and you answer to God. That when you accept that role, whether it's a mom or it's a ministry leader or some, some in your career, you've got something going on, and God says, this is it, this is how it's defined, you answer to me with this, you begin to grow up. It's not that you're forced to grow up. It's something happens inside of you. You begin to grow up and go, hey, this is bigger than me. This matters. And we said, well, wait a minute, wait a minute, though. But if you do that, you take on an enormous amounts of responsibility. And with all this responsibility, doesn't that create stress? Isn't that what creates stress is responsibility? So what do we do about that? And we came back and we looked at that. And we, we did discover stress is primarily not based on what you're going through at the time. It's your fear of the future. It's what's going to happen next. And so God gave us a principle for that, that we are responsible for the input. We are responsible to hear from Christ and then out of love and faith, we obey him. That's the input. Remember, it went into that box, and in that box, the stress has everything to do with, is your God trustworthy? Can you trust your God that if you put in the input, he's going to be responsible for the output? Can you trust him? He will do what's best with the output. You're not responsible for the output. He is. Which led us to this. Yeah, but how do I hear from God? If I'm making decisions, how do I hear from God? If, if this is how this is work, I'm responsible to owe him, obey him, and, and, and I'm going through life, and I'm trying to make the right decision. I'm trying to put in the right input. How, how do I hear from God? So uh, in decision making, um, we would love it. I mean, we would love it if life was kind of like this. And there's a number of people that I work with on the tech team, and uh, there's other people I've worked with in the past, and, and we get, they get done with the day, right? They're, it looks like this. Like, it's great. Like, you know where the beginning is. You know where the end is. You just take this little thing off, and you roll it out. Decision making is easy. But if you looked in the back of my truck, it looks like this. Now, have you ever tried to do this? Like, you think, well, this must be the beginning. That doesn't work. Uh, well, maybe this is the beginning then. That, that, where is, like, how do I make, now, let me ask you, in your life, when you're trying to hear from God, when you're trying to make decisions, does it feel a little bit like that? Does it feel like, I don't know, and I don't know how to find out, and I'm trying, and I keep pulling on things, but the more I pull on things, the tighter and the more of a mess that it becomes. So today, our whole goal is to answer the question, okay, I'm ready to hear from God, but how do I do that in really tough situations? Yes, that was a perfect throw. Okay, 
So as we, as we jump into this, we're going to jump into Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28. It's a passage. It's actually a passage that last week when I, I, I came to somebody in between services, I said, what would you change about the message? They said, you should, you should bring this passage in. You should talk about this passage. This fits perfect with what you're talking about. So, not so. I already planned it. This is what we're going to do. All right. Jesus says to the people following, and it was literally about they wanted to know what God says. What does the Father say? How do I, how do I hear from the Father? He says, come to me. And it starts there. We come to Jesus. All you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. The, 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 the tangled cord is a weary, burdened proposition. My wife and I, <laughs> we go over this quite often because she straightens them out for me, right? And says, listen, all you have to do is roll it up, right? And then uh, she gets it back and it, it, it's a mess. That weary, right? That weary, burdened mess. Now, a child thinks the way that you get rid, the way you find rest is you get rid of responsibility. The way you find rest is you just go play. Clean up your room. No, that would not be fun. I want to go, right? So I'm going to go rest. That's what vacation is supposed to be all about. Vacation is supposed to be that here's the world you live in. It's full of, ah. And so I'm going to walk out the door and leave all of this. And I'm going to go rest. But as you've all discovered, for half or three quarters of us, it just follows us out the door. But for those of you who succeeded it, when you walk back in the door, it's all here. Right? It's, it's still there. It's also super common for us. It makes sense. It's super common for us. That we go, listen, what I need to do is I need to pull back from ministry so I can rest. I'm too active. There's too much going on. I need to sleep more. Now, there's two or three of you who sleep three and a half hours a night. You do need to sleep more. But for the rest of us, see, rest doesn't come from the outside, guys. Rest comes from the inside. We have somebody in our church who, the other day, she contacted somebody and said, da, 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 da. Oh, hey, what'd you do today? I ran 37 miles. She wasn't kidding. She ran 30, on a Saturday for fun. <laughs> you know what that tells us? Our bodies have amazing potential what they can do. Your body's not tired because you're too active. Your body is tired because your soul is not at rest. And what Jesus is saying is, come to me. All you are weary and burdened, I'll give you rest. Take from me my yoke, take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart. Okay, uh, the yoke the yoke is by oxen, or we're going to talk about pulling horses, because uh, we don't use oxen that much in the United States, but we, there's still pulling horses out there that happen. And so my first question for you is this. How many of you have, have ever seen a pulling horse competition? I'm so sorry, guys. I am so one day, we just got to have a skyline going to the farm trip, right? We got, we got to do that. We absolutely have to do that. So this is how you train a new horse to pull. You take a seasoned horse, somebody who you can trust, and you put him in the yoke, and then you take the one who doesn't know anything, and you put him in the yoke next to him. And when you start out, the seasoned one does all of the work all of the pulling. The other one just has his head stuck in there. And he learns. He says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me. He learns from the other horse. And they go and they go and they, they learn how to turn. They learn how. And before long, he, he learns how to pull. He learns the feel. 
of what that's like on his shoulders. He learns how to pull. He knows when to bear down. He knows when it's easy. He, he, he takes this on. And I am gentle and humble in heart. You had to have in some Western movie, some movie, you had to have seen the scenes where they break a horse. And there's a couple of ways to break a horse. One is you get on that horse and you just beat him to death, man. You just, or he beats you to death, whichever one is stronger, right? And you just ride that thing, you ride that thing, and it's really hard. And then there's a horse whisper. A horse whisper, I don't actually know how they do it. I've seen, I've seen it, but I can't figure it out. They have the ability to gently and humbly of heart train a horse not to be wild, but to be productive. That's Christ. Christ does not come, beat the daylights out of you. It's with humble and gentle heart. And you will find rest for your souls. Now here's the really cool thing about a pulling horse. If you, the first time you ever go to one of these pulling horse competitions, you're going to be like, oh my goodness, that is so mean. They make those horses work so hard. That's because you, you don't understand that once a pulling horse learns to pull, they love it. When you put that yoke on them and you hook them up to something, you have to work very, very hard to keep them from pulling because they love to pull. Why? Because their heart loves to pull. And when Christ does this in your life, you are at rest for your souls. Therefore, you can run 37 miles. Therefore, you can do amazing things with your life. He says, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. What? My yoke is easy and my burden is light. It's pretty common for people to say, the Christian life is so hard. Oh, man, following Jesus, it's just so hard. That is not true. You're like, it's hard for me. We're going to find out later why that is. But, but I want you to understand, if you think that following Christ is hard, you're not yoked with him. I want, I want to say that again. I want you to grab a hold of that. If you think it's hard, you're not yoked with him. You may believe in him. You may be trying to follow him. But you're not yoked with him. His head is in the yoke. Yours is not. So how do we hear? How do we unravel this? We, we, we want to make a decision. We, 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 we want to fulfill this role. We have these responsibilities. We do don't want to be stressed, and so we're going to listen to God. And I'm going to do that. I'm responsible for the input. But how do I listen to God? How do I hear from God? I hear it many, many times people like, I'm trying to make this decision about buying a house. I can't hear from God. I, 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 should I buy this car? Should I move to this new community? Should I, what should I do with my career? God, tell me what to do. God, tell me what to do. He doesn't tell me anything. What's, what's going on? How do I know what to do? Well, I hear God clearly by, and I'm going to give you four super simple steps. Four super simple steps. I hear God clearly by, number one, delighting in Jesus' forgiveness and acceptance. Delighting in Jesus' forgiveness and acceptance. The Bible says, I will give you rest. Now, with almost every decision that you're trying to make, you're trying to find rest. This career, the whole goal of the career is what? To find rest. If I make this much money, if I get to this position, if I retire here, oh, I'm going to be able to rest. You better hurry. Like, you're only going to live 10 years after that. So I'm going to give up these 40 years so I can have rest here. Many times in your decision-making process, you're trying to prove that you are someone. You're trying to prove you have value. You're trying to prove to dad, I made it. I made something out of my life. You're trying to prove to your spouse, oh my goodness, the competition between spouses. It's on fire, right? You're trying to prove to your spouse, you're somebody. You can do it. You're the one. 
Some of you are trying to prove to your kids you got what it takes. Others of us are trying to use foreign substances to find rest. That's why you keep going in debt. You think that if you buy that thing, it'll bring you rest. It's why you smoke whatever it is you're smoking. It's why you're drinking whatever it is you're drinking. You think it's going to bring you rest. But it only comes from him. And where it comes from is this. I don't deserve your forgiveness. I know what I've done. I know what I've done with my life. I know what I've done with the people I love. I don't deserve your forgiveness. But I'll accept it. I'll take it. Thank you for it. And I don't deserve your acceptance. I'm not here trying to prove myself so Jesus will approve of me. No, no, no. His acceptance comes because of his grace whereby he gives me his righteousness. He died on the cross. He took my sin. Now he's giving me his righteousness. From that place right there, you'll hear from God. If you're trying to find rest in a different place, and this is true for all four of these, if you're trying to hear from God, what you're going to hear is... Why? Because you're underwater. You went underwater. You're looking for rest someplace out there. Come up. Accept his forgiveness. You see, for those of you who accepted Christ as your personal Savior, do you remember? Do you remember when you accepted Christ as your Savior and that sin was lifted off of you? And you knew he accepted you? You remember what you said in your heart? You said, this is it. This is all I need. I don't need anything else. This is awesome. You, did you know you can live from there every day? And if you want to hear from God, that's where you hear from God from. I don't deserve what I've been given, but thank goodness I've been given it. It goes on to say, whoever believes in me, as Scripture has said, uh, has said, rivers of living water will flow within them. What? Rivers of living water. Is that ever, for those of you who heard that phrase before, did you know Jesus told people that if you drink from me, you'll never thirst again? You're like, man, I, I don't know about that. I, I mean, it was so great at the beginning, but I, that's because you're drinking salt water. That's because Christ is living water, and you drank from Christ, and you, you drank from that acceptance. You drank from that forgiveness, but now you're trying to prove yourself. Now you, you, you've got other things going on in your life, and you think those things are going to satisfy. It's salt water. It just makes you thirsty. Come back to the foundation of life, which is this beautiful relationship with Jesus. Number two. Obeying what I know of God's word and learning more. Obeying of what I know of God's word and learning more. Now, for many of you, you don't know that much about the Bible. You're like, I don't know that much about the Bible. There's so much I don't know, and there's so much I wish I knew. Guess what? There's a ton you do know. There is a ton you do know. Now, if you only know one thing, obey that one thing. Like, no, 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 no. No, I need to know five. I need to know five things. As soon as I know five things, then I'll obey, I'll obey the one thing. Nope. No. Many, many times people are like, if I knew more, I could do better. That's not true. It's just not true. There are, there are, there are cultures throughout the world who from time to time, they've gotten a piece of God's word. Like maybe the book of John or, or some, there was one culture that got half of the book of John. They planted churches. They started churches. And these people were loving each other and caring for each other. And, uh, and then other people came to these countries or to these villages. And they're like, you guys are really living out the life of Christ. Like, you must really know your Bibles. They're like, uh, well, we only have this much. But we practice every word of it. That's where you are. That's where you are. You do it by obeying it and 
than adding to what you already know. The Bible says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me. You only learn by obedience. You only learn by obedience. I, I used to coach football, and there's a very simple truth in any kind of coaching. If it does not hurt, they are not going to change. And guess what? Until they actually practice it, they actually do it, they have not changed. It takes obedience. It's how you learn. You do what the coach tells you to do. Jesus replied, anyone who loves me will, be, will obey my teaching. My father will love them and, he will, and we will come to them and make our home with them. In other words, if you obey out of love, you're going to hear from God the Father. He's going to be right there with you. You're going to hear from him. He says it a little stronger. Anyone who does not love me will not obey my teaching. These words you hear are not my own. They belong to the Father who sent me. How am I going to get to those words? Obey what you know. Number three, serving according to God's priorities. Serving according to God's priorities. Now, this whole priority thing is, is really important. I, I can't believe I missed this, but in my life, I kind of did miss this. Here's the deal with priorities. Priorities work this way. If you have four priorities, they have to be in order. It has to be, this is the most important priority. This is the second most. This is the third most. And this is the fourth most. Fourth most. I do number one. Here comes number two. If doing number two means I can't do number one, I don't do number two. For some of you, this is earth shattering because you think you're responsible to do all four. And somehow you keep sacrificing number one for number four. If you live that way, your life is a mangled set of cords. If you understand and you practice it, no, 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 I do number one, and then I do number two, and then I do number three, and if number three means I can't do number two, I'm not doing number three, I'm doing number two. Decision making becomes very clear, pretty easy. It gets really mangled when we're trying to do number seven and not number one. When number seven will stop us from doing number one, but we're like, how do I make it all happen? How do I get it all to work? How do I make these decisions? How do I hear from God? Well, fortunately, God was pretty clear on the priorities. The basic priorities, he's pretty clear. Number one is God. Number one is your relationship with God. It's that you spend time with God. Here's your priorities. That you develop your relationship with God. And for many of us, we meet Christ, we meet God, and then we have these other priorities that he has given to us, and we ignore him so we can accomplish those priorities. What do I mean? I mean, you get up in the morning, you eat your food, you take care of your kids, you kiss your wife, you go to work, and you've never talked to God at all. You didn't talk to him. Well, yeah, but these other things are important. They are, but he has a clear set of priorities. He comes first. He comes first. Then comes my spouse. So my priorities, and this is crystal clear, the priority of my life is my relationship with God, to live from a place whereby I'm accepting his forgiveness, his acceptance, and then love my wife. What do you mean, love your wife? Provide, protect, cherish. In such a way that she can blossom. In such a way that she will grow in Christ where she'll feel like she's the most loved person in the world. That's my priority. And then comes my children, which is to raise them up in the nurture and the admission of the Lord. And then comes my church. You're like, well, wait a minute. I, 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 I don't have any kids. Good, yours is easy. God. Church, God, spouse, church. I, I don't have a spouse. Okay, yours is easy. God, church. 
That's your priorities. Where's my career? Well, I don't know. What's your career for? What's it there for? Why do you have a career? What about my hobbies? What are they for? Aren't they a priority? Aren't they important? Don't they give me rest? There's definitely a place for them. But they come down the line. And you, you kind of, well, we'll read this passage. I am gentle and humble of heart, in heart. And in Ephesians, it gives us these priorities. Husbands, love your wives, raise your kids, build the body of Christ. Number four, sharing Christ with my circle of influence. You know what your career is for? Your career is so that you can love God. Your career is so that you can love your wife. Your career is so you can raise your kids in the nurture and the admission of the Lord. Your career is so you can build the church. And the mission of your career, that's the purpose of your career. The mission of your career is so that you can share Christ with people in your circle of influence. He says, come on to me, you will find rest in your souls. The mission of your life is to introduce people to Christ who can give them life. It's to share life with Christ and then share life with people so they can see Christ. I want that to settle for a little bit because maybe you've heard this before. And you're like, listen, I got a lot going on, man. It's just flipped right past your head. And you're like, Pastor Chris, you're only saying that because you're a pastor and it's your mission. Actually, my mission is to teach you how to do your mission. That's actually my mission. I get really confused because I love this mission so much that I run off there and go after it. But actually, my mission is to teach you how to do your mission. So... This fourth one, the first three, right? You're like, yeah, that's good. That's great. Yep, that makes sense. Yep, okay, we can go with that. But I watch people get to this one and go, three out of four is good, right? Like three out of four is really good, right? But this is why you can't hear God. Because you think your mission is you. You see, at the center, ultimately at the center of your life is you. No, no, it's my family. So let's, let's walk through that for a little bit. Did you know that your mission is not your relationship with God? That's not the mission. You're not sent out to have a relationship with God. That's the foundation of your life. It's the foundation of who you are. It's from that foundation that you're sent on this mission. Well, certainly my spouse, my marriage is my mission. You'll become inward. You'll become inward. And you might have a pretty good marriage. It won't be what God has for you. It won't be what it could be. But it will ultimately be about the two of you. You're like, my mission is my kids. You can't tell me that's not the most important thing in the world. I can absolutely tell you it's not the most important thing in the world. Did you know the mission for your child is 18 years long? You're going to live to be about 80 years old. That means you're going to spend one-fourth of your life on that part of the mission. Yes, if you have 13 kids, you can stretch that out. <laughs> Right? You can stretch that out. But here's the big deal, guys. I wish, I wish so bad I could communicate this to you. I, I think you find it so unbelievable. It, it, it often doesn't catch it. You can't grab it. I wish I could communicate this to you. This dream you have for your children, that they will know Jesus, that they will not go through the heartache that you've gone through because you didn't know Jesus, 
this dream you have that your kids grow up and have great marriages and then they raise their kids to have character if you take the mission out of it you're gonna warp your kids I, I can't say it strong enough they'll miss their mission and when you miss your mission you you become inward and when you become inward you can't hear from God why because he keeps he keeps calling you to this mission and you keep going I don't want to hear that I want to focus on my mission I, I don't want to hear that that's just for pastors and Jesus freaks I don't want to hear that oh no it's absolutely for you when I say mission I mean this is why you're on the face of the earth this is what you've been called to do it's what your hobbies your career your quirks everything is there for that mission and here's something that's beautiful these priorities this list they're not in conflict they're not in conflict. When you live forgiven and accepting, it's not in conflict with obeying or priorities or mission. It goes right together. When, when you are like, I'm going to obey God, that is not in conflict with the other three. When you say, I am going to Love God. I'm going to love my wife. I'm going to train up my kids. That is not in conflict with mission. It runs beautifully together. What is in conflict is, I'm just going to go for three out of four. I'm just going to go for two out of four. I'm just going to hear what God has to say. Then I'm going to decide if I'm going to obey. So, there's somebody who has practiced this in their lives, and uh, we're going to get to meet them. So, say hello to the Ebays. Hi, my name is Kalechi Ebay. I've been coming to Skyline Church for quite some time now. I'm an elder here at the church as well, um, along with my wife, Katie. I lead the high school ministry here. I lead the boys, of course. Um, I'm also a phys ed teacher here at Bloomfield High School. And we've been living in town as a married couple for about eight years now. Uh, I'm Katie Ive. I have been going to Skyline for the last decade, actually 12 years now. Um, I am the leader of the high school ministry and I, um, during the week, am the director of academic operations at a high school in Newark. We have been married for the last eight years and together we have two wonderful little kiddos. Uh, Connor is five and Cora is three and that's us. Our decision making process is based on four key principles. The first one being uh, the matter of our priorities. Our first is we put our number one priority in God, and then it's of course in each other, and then that leads and trickles down to how we love our, and lead our children. And then our second um, principle is, uh, what does the Bible say? And sometimes when we're doing decisions, it is very clear what the Bible says about something, and then other times it's not as clear, but we always, as our second principle, go to like, what does the Bible say about this particular thing? And then that leads us to our third principle is whenever there's something that's in doubt or we're hesitant about, we turn back to the Bible. And in Romans 14, 23, it reads, whenever um, you're in doubt, you really question and understand, is this action in love? If this action isn't leading towards loving someone or loving each other, of course, loving God, then we should avoid doing it. When in doubt, don't do in it. In doubt, don't do it. And then the fourth is that um, Kalechi is always responsible um, for all decisions that we make. So it doesn't mean that I don't make decisions that is something that we've agreed on or not, but at the end of the day, he is um, fully responsible. So if there's something that the Bible says we could do one or two things, or it's in line with our um, priorities, at the end of the day, he makes the final decision. And his final decision could be that he defaults to me. 
Like, right? It could be, I don't care what the colors of these walls are, right? There's no biblical principles or whatever. Mm -hmm. That's my decision. But he is always responsible for whatever that decision is. One of the really cool things about us um, getting married is that we both saw decision making the same prior to ever knowing each other. And because we went into getting to know each other, and even before we like dating, uh, our dating practices were all biblically based in like getting to know each other, nothing physical, like very much like, um, where do we see this? And I remember like before we even officially started dating, us having a conversation of like, do we see ourselves getting married someday? We're gonna, we're not even gonna actually officially date mm -hmm. unless we see ourselves um, getting married um, because like biblically, we understood like what that commitment um, meant and like there wasn't a purpose of dating if there, we didn't see that down the road. We, uh, of course, lean heavily on the principles and the truths in the Bible, and especially when it comes to parenting, rely on uh, Proverbs 22, where it says, train up a child in the way he should go. And for us, that means character, decision-making, putting other people first. In terms of character, one thing that I really heavily rely on and try to impart it to our kids is you can only control yourself. Like you can't control what your friends are saying or what your friends are doing, what your teacher, your neighbor, you can't really control any of that. All you really can do is control how you respond to it or how you're gonna love these people through that. So with that in mind, emotions, uh, feelings, all those are something that's internal, something that you might not even be in control of. But once again, you can control your action. So when I get my mind set towards, okay, this is what God is saying through this situation, or this is what my parents have taught me and how to respond through this situation, and then just living that out. We really believe that it very much matters that the two of us are on the same page and that what we tell our kids and what we have them do um, is biblically based and that we are always like telling them the same thing so that they can always trust what they're hearing. And so what that looks like in practice, if there's a big decision point coming for our kids that we always check in first. And if it's something that isn't a quick conversation or something that we've discussed before, um, the two of us have a monthly um, parent meeting that we do um, the second Friday of every month that we like put ahead on on our agenda, like big decisions. So that might be where our kids are going to school um, in the future or something that like uh, has come up that we want to be something that we like make it a firm decision that this is happening. And so we have that meeting every month that we can have those discussions and pull out the Bible and really make um, a firm decision. Having lived here for the vast majority of my life and also having Skyline here and teaching here and, and being so involved in the community here, I knew that it was very important for us as a family to stay within this area. So the thought of leaving Bloomfield or moving out of Bloomfield, of course, it came up, it was discussed, but ultimately it was, it was almost counterproductive to everything that we were doing to leave Bloomfield and then still have to come back into our community. It was better for us as a family to stay in, stay in town. And when we think about like our ministry and raising our kids, we also will never do something that's detrimental to our kids. We very much go back to the priority of um, God first, then our marriage, then our kids, and then our ministry. And so we knew that our ministry, like God had made very clear that our ministry and long-term mission is um, Bloomfield, whether it is the high school kids that he works with on a day-to-day -day basis at Bloomfield High School or in our high school ministry. As we started looking at all the options, knowing those principles allowed us to close certain doors. And then as doors started closing, um, it brought us back it got us to our um, final house, but every step of the way of our different options, it was um, what has God told us about what our ministry and calling is and what are our priorities in our marriage and for our kids. Not getting too caught up in what the world says or what the world does, but instead in, in the face of all that or in spite of all that, we're gonna trust in God. And this is the direction that we're gonna be going. If, if others wanna get on board, we can, we can explain and show and share, of course, uh, but this is where we're going. All right, so for you, what are you going to do with this? What are you going to do with what, 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 what we're talking about today? Do you have a clear source of joy? Start there. Do you have a clear source of joy? His name is Jesus. He's inviting you into his rest. Do you have a clear master? Do you know who is your master? 
Are you clear that his name is Jesus? He will never lie to you. He will never lead you wrong. Do you have a clear set of priorities? Do you understand? Number one is number one. We don't do number two if it conflicts with number one. And lastly, do you have a clear mission? Do you have a clear mission? Have you said yes to Jesus? Right now of areas where I've said yeah but yeah but folks you in the, in the crowd identify that yeah but identify that area that Jesus talked about to you today can you say these words with your heart to him Jesus yes I will accept your forgiveness. I don't deserve it, but I'll accept it. Yes. The only thing that makes me worthy is what you bring to my life. What's your area? Where do you need to say yes to Jesus this morning? Say it. Lord, thank you that the truth is you never stop talking to us. And therefore, we can live lives worth living. In your name we pray, amen.